been there. We've all witnessed a movie that left us scratching our heads in disbelief. The odd thing is, someone at some time, for some unexplainable reason, thought making this film was a good idea. One such movie was the 1963 black and white classic, The Crawling Hand. I'm old man Kelly and I can't help myself. I need to know the story, the who's, the when's, and the why's. Now before I get started, I want to say that if you first came across this movie on Mystery Science Theater 3000, like I did, then the film you saw was a heavily edited version. The complete film makes a bit more sense. Not a lot more sense, but a tad more. The man responsible for this film was Herbert J. Strock. Herbert lived from 1918 to 2005. He was born in Boston, but by the time he was 13, his home was Los Angeles. A student of journalism and film, he graduated from USC in 1941. During World War II, he served in the Army and was a member of the Army's Ordnance Motion Picture Division. He was mainly a TV director, directing episodes of such shows as The Cases of Eddie Drake, Science Fiction Theater, I Led Three Lives, and Highway Patrol, among others. He also found the time to direct the occasional film, such as 1954's Gog, 1955's Battle Taxi, 1957's I Was a Teenage Frankenstein, 1958's How to Make a Monster, and 1962's The Devil's Messenger. According to Strzok, a producer named Joe Robertson gave a man named Kenneth Hertz a script to read that he was thinking of producing. It was for a science fiction horror film. Hertz gave it to Strzok to read and Strzok thought it was awful. He told Robertson, let me show you how it should be written and gave him a copy of a script he had written years earlier with a friend, William Idelson, called Tomorrow You Die. Robertson put up $100,000 for Strzok to make the film and the good news for Strzok, Robertson was a total hands-off producer letting Strzok do as he pleased. In the book, Interviews with B-Science Fiction and Horror Filmmakers by Tom Weaver, Strzok said, If I remember right, that picture was shot completely on location. We never once set foot in a studio. Even the computer banks and stuff were shot at the USC Computer Division Center. It was a minor film. It was made for peanuts, as I said, but it was a lot of fun to do. The film stars Rod Lauren as Paul Lawrence. Rod, whose real name is Roger Lawrence Strunk, lived from 1941 to 2007. He had an interesting history, and it starts with RCA Records and the end of rock and roll. Or at least what they thought was the end. They thought rock and roll was dead because at the time, 1959, Elvis was in the army, Buddy Holly had died in a plane accident, Chuck Berry was serving a three-year jail sentence, Little Richard had moved into gospel music, and the rock and roll payola scandal was making all the headlines. So RCA was looking for the next sound, and they took a cue from the movie industry and took it upon themselves to discover the next big star. This new talent would record a new type of music that would appeal to all teenagers. It would be slow, dreamy ballads and love songs. They put up $100,000 to promote this potential star. They had a contest to pick out the next big singer, and out of 300 people, they picked the tall, green-eyed, moody, rebellious Rod Lauren. And it didn't hurt that Rod had a slight resemblance to James Dean. In 1960, he had a minor hit with a tune called, If I Had a Girl. All my love, all my heart I would give to her. was picked by Paramount Pictures and producer Hal Wallace to star with John Wayne in the film The Sons of Katie Elder. In a blink of an eye, Rod went from a total unknown to a would-be superstar. But Rod, well, he had an attitude problem. He was an angry young man and soon he upset enough people that he was dropped from both the record company and Paramount Pictures having never made a film. I got too much too soon. It embarrassed me because I didn't feel I deserved it. I was unhappy. And when you're unhappy, there are clashes, he says. He became known as Hollywood's youngest has-been. By age 22, he was trying to make a comeback. 
He signed with producer Herman Cohen and started getting parts in B-films like Terrified, The Black Zoo, and The Gun Hawk all in 1963. He also appeared on several TV shows like Alfred Hitchcock Presents. And that led to our film, The Crawling Hand. Not me, Professor. When I make it, I'll make it on my own. All the way. Director Strock said of Rod, I felt that Rod was a one-dimensional actor with a one-octave range. His co-star in the picture, his love interest, Marta Farmstrom, was played by the beautiful Siri Steffens. Siri was born in Iceland in 1938 with the name, which I will not attempt to pronounce. Don't let her character in the film fool you, Siri was a very intelligent woman who spoke at least five languages. She was singing with various bands around Iceland when she reluctantly entered the Miss Iceland competition and won. The Crown brought her to Long Beach, California in 1960 to compete in the first ever Miss International pageant. It's never been difficult for me to pose, she said. I haven't had a lesson in my life, but I love it and I've been posing since I was six years old. I'd love to be a doctor, Siri says, but it takes so long, at least eight years, and by then I'll be in my 30s. That's why so few girls study medicine or law in Iceland. She didn't win the Miss International pageant, but while in the U.S., she thought she would give acting a try. She Americanized her name to Siri Steffens. Her first acting job was a small part in the 1962 film Hitler, starring Richard Basehart as Adolf Hitler. That same year, she had a role in three episodes of the Beverly Hillbillies, and that led to The Crawling Hand. I only planned to come to California for a year to see Grandfather go to an American school for a while. Nothing has come up to change my plans. Herbert L. Strock said this about Sari. We had this Miss Ireland, Sari Steffens in the lead. She wasn't much of an actress, but she was a doll to look at. We had a nude scene to do, which Sari Steffens didn't want to do. She would only do it if I put body makeup on her. She trusted me implicitly, because I'm a prude, I guess. We shot the scene, it was never used. Her acting career didn't last long. By 1964, she was back in Iceland. She became a teacher. Peter Breck plays Steve Curran. Like there's something. The same something that was in our pilot. Breck lived from 1929 to 2012. He had a very long acting career, mostly on TV, including playing the middle son Nick in the 1960s show The Big Valley. He was also in films such as The Beatniks from 1958 and The Wild and the Innocent from 1959. He plays one of the NASA men, oh wait, I mean the space operations men that research the crawling hand. Breck's partner in the investigation is Dr. Max Weisberg, played by Kent Taylor. You think he knew about Don and Mel Lockhart? Kent was on this earth from 1907 to 1986 and acted in both films and TV for 43 years, with too many credits to list. Late in his career, he made a few B-horror films such as The Day Mars Invaded Earth from 62, Blood of Ghastly Horror from 67, Brides of Blood from 68, and Brains of Blood from 71. Kent, though, was a problem during filming as he only got the part because Strock turned down another up-and-coming actor, one who would go on to great success. In the book, Interviews Too Shocking to Print by Justin Humphreys, Strock said, I made my big mistake in Kent's part because Burt Reynolds came to me and he wanted to play the part. And I read Burt and he was lousy. He said, please let me study it and read it again. And I did, and I said, you're just not up to it. Kent came in and being a radio actor, he read the part and fooled me. During the picture, he couldn't remember his lines. He was never on time. He gave me a lot of problems. The Secretary of Space Operations, Donna, is played by the beautiful and totally underused Allison Hayes. The press. What do we tell them? We can release no statement at this time. Allison was born Mary Jane Hayes in Charlton, West Virginia, and graced this earth from 1930 to 1977. Mary Jane won the title of Miss District of Columbia in 1949 and represented D.C. in the Miss America pageant that same year. From this, she moved on to local TV and then to Universal Pictures in Hollywood. 
Her career never really took off as a major Hollywood actress, and soon she was in B pictures, such as a couple of Roger Corman films, Gunslinger and the Undead, as well as Zombies of Moritau, The Unearthly, and The Disembodied, all between 1956 and 1957. Her most famous role was in 1958's Attack of the 50-Foot Woman, in which she plays the title character. All of you! I'm not drunk! I'm not! You've got to believe me! Please. It was right in the middle of the highway, 30 feet tall! <laughs> By the time she made The Crawling Hand, she was mostly working in TV, but her career ended early due to health problems. In my opinion, she should have had a better career than what she had. Arlene Judge plays Mrs. Hodgkiss. That boy, I'd like you to hold him tomorrow. Why the shower curtain? Arlene had a long career, mostly in B films, but her real claim to fame were her marriages. She was married seven times, many marriages lasting less than a year. The Crawling Hand was one of her last pictures. Arlene was 51 years old at the time, and this was considered her comeback role after a 20-year absence from Hollywood. Unfortunately, it didn't work out. And then there's Alan Hale Jr. as the sheriff. Who? Paul. Paul Lawrence. Will you stop talking so fast? I can't understand a word you're saying. Alan lived from 1921 to 1990 and is the son of actor Alan Hale Sr. There's no question that they are father and son. His father's real last name was Rufus Edward McCahan. Now, Alan had a long career starting in 1933 in both TV and films. He starred in the 1957 TV show Casey Jones, but is best known for his role as Captain Jonas Grumby, better known as the Skipper, in the TV comedy Gilligan's Island from 1964 to 1967. And lastly, how about this guy? The old man at the soda shop. He's played by Sid Saylor. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. Sid was born in 1895 and started out in silent films, including a series of two real comedy shorts, Let George Do It, as the title character. By the time of this film, he was more of a TV actor appearing in many shows. Sadly, he passed away before the release of this film at the young age of 67. So what is the story of The Crawling Hand? Well, you see an astronaut, Captain Mel Lockhart, is returning from the moon, but he has a problem. He's been infected, possessed, or something that makes him want to kill. I don't know, Steve. This is Doc Weisberg. How long have you been without oxygen? 15, maybe 20 minutes. He pleads with Dr. Max Weisberg and Steve Curran to push a red button that'll destroy the capsule. He could do it himself, of course, but for some reason, he doesn't want to. Dr. Max eventually pushes the red destruct button, and along with Steve and Donna, listen in horror as the ship explodes. This is the second time this has happened. you think they would have learned from the first time. But Max does have a theory about why this is happening. And I don't think Lockhart was alone on his return flight any more than Nelson was. Oh, no. <laughs> I'm not talking about little green men. As a matter of fact, I may not talk at all unless I get some encouragement. Well, what do you need, a, a drink, man? Meanwhile, we cut to two young lovers, Paul Lawrence and Marta Farnstrom. Paul is a medical student, and Marta is from Sweden, who is in the U.S. for a year to spend time with her grandfather, Professor Farnstrom. She also has a best friend, Patsy Townsend, who is the daughter of the local sheriff. Now, the talk of the malt shop, which doesn't allow dancing or rats, by the way, is what is believed to be a meteor that fell the night before. Hey, Paul, what are they saying over at the school about that thing in the sky last night? Well, nothing. Why? Everybody said it was a meteor. <laughs> Hey, come on, don't tell me you're still scared of them flying saucers. But we, as the audience, know it was the space capsule. Also, while at the malt shop, we hear a bit of the tune, The Bird is the Word by the Revingtons. <laughs> now, 
Now, one day after school, Paul and Marta are on the beach, frolicking around. Marta makes a horrible discovery. The arm and hand of the fallen astronaut. Somehow, in something that's never quite explained, Paul has an immediate attraction to the astronaut's body part. Let me go back for it. I'll lock it in the trunk of the car. No, no, I couldn't stand it. That's correct to the sheriff. This is a murder. No, not a murder. A human hand, not a murder? Sadly for Paul, he leaves without the arm because of Marta. But Paul goes back the next day with a shower curtain. Now Paul, well, he lives at a home with an older woman named Mrs. Hodgkiss. I'm guessing he rents a room out? I don't know. Mrs. Hodgkiss carries around a gun with a hair trigger. Meanwhile, Max and Steve talk about a rat. This rodent was on a spaceship and has become intelligent due to cosmic rays. In the beginning, we thought he was completely unaffected, but he wasn't. By no means. You see, he's in that cage alone because I can't trust him. I don't know when he'll turn on the other rats and kill him. Now, he can unlock an ordinary cage. That's why I had that padlock put on there. Is there a connection? Well, Max thinks so. Now, one night, Mrs. Hodgkiss becomes the first victim of the crawling hand. While she's being strangled, her pistol goes off, and Paul runs in to find the body. Then he calls the local sheriff. Operator, give me the sheriff, quick. I'll be there in five minutes. That night, for some unexplained reason, Paul tries to call Dr. Max Operator, Weisberg. Distance, but before he has a chance to connect with Max, the hand attacks. Thank you. Ring it for me. Paul goes unconscious, but he doesn't die. When the ambulance drivers show up to collect the body of Mrs. Hodgkiss, they find Paul and take him too, because why not? When Paul wakes in the ambulance next to the dead old lady, he freaks out. Now, Paul is infected or possessed or something and looks a little zombie-ish now and then. It's one of those possessions that, you know, comes and goes. What's controlling the arm and hand and why does it want to kill randomly? Your guess is as good as mine. Now, Sheriff Townsend suspects Paul of the murder because he didn't want to leave the home where the murder happened. The problem, though, is the fingerprints. They're not of Paul's, but those of the dead astronaut. Kid? Certainly the kid. You know the way he's been acting. The only one could possibly have done it. Now they come up with a man named Lockhart. And they're taking over. Earl, I'll tell you what's happened. They've got so many fingerprints in Washington, they've got them all mixed up. Marta, who has disappeared from this film for far too long, is concerned with Paul and goes to the home to find out what's happening. But Paul isn't having any of it and does his best James Dean to get rid of her. Get her out of this house! Now, while the sheriff waits for the government officials to arrive, Max and Steve show up doing their own investigation. Well, that's just it, Sheriff. We're from space operation. Space? Space operation? Oh, now, wait a minute, boys. This is Palms, California, population 2,306. A woman gets knocked off and... We know all about that, Sheriff. We just want to ask you a few questions. So... Paul tries to connect with them, but they never quite get together. When they do run into each other, unfortunately, Max and Steve meet Zombie Paul. Paul runs off and tries to kill the old man who runs the malt shop. We do get to hear a bit more of the song from the Revingtons. Hey, they paid for the song, they're gonna use it. The old man doesn't die, and I suppose, well, that's necessary for the happy ending. Oh, sorry, spoiler. Now Marta and her friend Patsy are in her bedroom having girl talk. Oh, but he'll be okay. Oh, Patsy. 
I just don't understand it. What's happened to him? It was terrible. He screamed at me. Why is he staying in that house? Patsy leaves with Marta's grandfather to get some food, leaving Marta alone. Paul shows up and, after climbing through the window, expresses his confusion over what's been happening. There are times when I'm all right, and then I'm not, and then I'm, and then when I'm myself and I'm not, and the periods when I'm myself are getting shorter and shorter. Do I... Do you understand? No. Well, then don't try. Before too long, he becomes Zombie Paul and tries to choke Marta to death. And, well, he fails again. Paul runs away just before Sheriff Townsend arrives, and now the chase is on. Now, of course, there are some issues with this film. First of all, what's Paul's fascination with the arm? I mean, why does he keep the arm? What did he have in mind? What's his endgame? Was he already being influenced by the arm before he took it home and put it in the pantry? It didn't seem to really affect him till he was on the phone calling Dr. Max Weisberg, so assuming he wasn't possessed until then, why did he take it? Speaking of the hand, we never learn what's possessing it. I would guess that was the filmmaker's intent to leave it mysterious, but we need something. What is its endgame? At least we know Jason was killing camp counselors because of the death of his mother, but why does the hand kill? And does it think? And how does its mind control powers work? But of course, assuming it has a reason, even if it's unknown to the viewer, the biggest issue is one of leverage. How can an arm and a hand without a body choke somebody? I suppose that once it has a grip on the neck, it could dig in, but still, without a body for support, it seems it would be pretty simple to pull it away. And since it doesn't fly, unless you're laying in bed, or standing near a staircase, it seems pretty powerless. But if we accept all that, that the hand has some sort of end game and it's actually dangerous, there's still a problem and that's the story itself. Is it about a space agency trying to cover up their mess or the relationship between Paul and Marta? Perhaps a little less with the space people and a little more of the story of the teen couple might have been better. In the film, after Paul is possessed, Marta is almost forgotten about until the end. I could imagine a movie this way. Paul's possessed half wants to kill Marta and fights with Paul's human half who loves Marta. Imagine Paul about to kill Marta and then throwing himself off a cliff or something, sacrificing himself to save the one he loves. Now there's an ending. Or maybe it could be a story in which Marta is trying to save Paul. But then again, of course, Siri Steffens would have something to do in this film except look pretty, and that would be silly. The bottom line is, why should we care about any of these characters? Who are they? What is the conflict? Does anybody have any agency? Even if Paul used the arm to get revenge on his enemies, that would have been something. But no, you couldn't have any of that happen because then you couldn't have the cheesy happy ending. And speaking of the end, and this is a spoiler, it gives us the appearance of a happy ending. First of all, lucky for the world, there are junkyard cats who like to eat arms. But really, if you think about it, Paul tried to kill his girlfriend, Marta. And I can accept the fact that she wouldn't press charges. But how about the malt shop guy? He was almost killed by Paul. And I know, like you know, that Paul was possessed by the arm. But try to prove that in court. <laughs> that might be a tad difficult. Now at the very end, we come back to the two ambulance drivers who are there, I guess, for comic relief. I really didn't talk about them much earlier because, well, I didn't care about them and they're not very funny. But the very end has them look into the box that's supposed to have the hand, and it isn't there. We get the, it's not over yet ending. <sighs> and now it's time for looking for something good. Also known as, why should I watch this movie? For one, Sari Steffens. Okay, she isn't much of an actress, but she is adorable. And for those whose eyes go the other way, Rod Lauren is a pretty handsome young man, and he does his best James Dean. But seriously, although this film is silly and it doesn't make a lot of sense, it's still a fun watch. Some of the space agency scenes drag on a bit, 
and maybe that's why they were cut from the MST3K version. But still, if you want cheese, you got it. And the music's pretty good. I mean, not only the Revingtons, but also the other music done by an uncredited Marlon Skiles. Marlon has done music for such films as The Lady and the Monster from 1944, Gilda from 1946, The Disembodied from 57, Queen of Outer Space from 58, The Hypnotic Eye from 60, The Violent Ones from 67, among others. And I really don't know why he was uncredited in this film. Now there's one scene people like to make fun of. In the version shown on Mystery Science Theater, you can clearly see Siri pulling up her bathing suit over her already covered backside. In the film's defense, this was shot with the idea of it being cropped for widescreen to give the illusion of nudity. But like what often happened back in the day when the film was to be shown on TV, the uncropped footage was used since it worked better for TV's aspect ratio. Ed Wood's Plan 9 from Outer Space suffered the same thing. That's why the boom microphone shadow was seen in the cockpit. It wouldn't have been that way if you saw it in the theater. And I thought I would finish up by reading a letter to the editor that came out in a newspaper in November of 1963. It was from a Mrs. Sandra Brannies, and she wasn't complaining about the movie so much, but about its advertisement. After first complaining about the pornographic picture of Jane Mansfield in the paper for the movie Promises, Promises, she had this to say, Then this morning, what should be advertised but the crawling hand? A nude picture with the caption, She revealed her body but not her secret. Do we as parents just sit still and let this kind of thing appear in our newspapers and movie screens? It seems it did no good to appeal to the theater manager. But what can we do? One thing... Don't go see them. Some parents in Houston did do something in the form of a parents' league in that direction. This is something I think we could all think about. It is my understanding in the near future we will be hearing more about this parents' league here in Victoria. So let's all support it when we do.